Chomsky's method, also known as the method of continuous variation, is often something that people have a hard time spotting exactly what we're talking about with. So I thought I'd try a different approach in this video. What I've done is I've modeled the entire thing, and I'll show you the whole calculation piecemeal. But we're going to start from things as if we had just done this experiment. So what we decided is we wanted to have a total concentration of all of our species in our cell as 1.00 times 10 to the negative 4. So in order to have that target, we chose to have a metal and a ligand, or this could have been anything that would combine to form something. But I chose a metal and ligand. And so we'll go ahead and choose some ratio of these solutions. Now you can see here that what I've done is I've just gone down by 0.1 for each of these, and I've increased the 5.1 molar on the other component. So I've stayed with the same total concentration throughout. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix these together. And I'm going to get some total solution. And then I'm going to stick that on a spectrometer, and I'll measure the absorbance. And you can see that we start out with a decent size absorbance, which is telling us that the metal itself actually was absorbing. The ligand, <coughs> if we look at when the solution only had ligand in it, it was absorbing a little bit, but nowhere near as much. And then in between, what we see is that we had an increasing amount of absorbance, which reaches a maximum, and then starts decreasing again with that ratio. So let's think through exactly what would be in my solution in terms of what I put there, what would end up happening next, and then we'll think through what that's telling us about this concentration. Now one approach we could have used is we could try to determine our molar concentration, our molar absorptivity, just by saying, okay, this is the only component I have here. I have a known concentration. I know my path length, so I can determine my molar absorptivity. And we could do the same thing down on this end. But we'd actually be kind of wasting our time if we were to do that, because there's actually a much more straightforward approach that's going to make itself evident when we use the actual jobs method. So instead of going the long way around on this calculation, let's just go ahead and see the short way. Now what I'm showing here is the rest of the calculation, so please don't jump into the whole thing and try to interpret every piece of it. I'm going to walk through it piecemeal. And for this, I'm going to appeal to our magic wand of knowing stuff at the beginning and say, since we can peek inside and see exactly what's really happening, we're going to see everything already knowing the outcome in order to understand why it works when we don't see all those pieces moving. All right, so suppose that we took our metal and our ligand. And let's say that in this particular setup, it's going to have a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. So one metal binds with one ligand. Now I've also specified my molar absorptivity times my path length, just so that I have all my constants in one spot. And I said my metal is going to be 1,000, my ligand is going to be 100, and the metal ligand complex is going to be 10,000. I just picked some really typical, realistic examples, just as something to test out on this. Now, here what I've done is I've calculated a mole fraction, and this is just taking the concentration of the metal divided by the total of the metal and the ligand. I didn't put a second set of parentheses on the bottom there, uh, to avoid confusing things with too many parentheses, so it's that divided by this entire quantity. You can see here that, yeah, it's going to be 100% in the form of the metal. So you come down here, we're at the 50-50 mark, so 50%. As we get all the way down, we're at 0%. In metal form, everything else would be in the ligand form. Now, when already knowing ahead of time that our stoichiometry is 1 to 1, it's fairly straightforward for us to spot what our limiting reagent is going to be in each of those cases. So when I don't have any ligand, obviously the ligand is my limiting reactant. My metal is in excess. As I add in some of the ligand, I have much smaller amounts versus what I have versus of the metal, and with it being a one-to-one -one ratio, knowing that ahead of time, we say, okay, yeah, ligand is going to remain limiting right up till we get to the 50-50. At that point, really for this cell, I might say either one, so neither one is really limiting. They're both in uh, improper stoichiometric ratio. But I just had it set up as a quick little Excel equation, and I decided not to get any more fancy than this already was, especially since it was going to affect any machinery following uh, the way that I had it set up. All right, so what we did now is we said, okay, these were our initial concentrations. Once we actually start binding them together, how much of the metal ligand complex am I going to make, and what am I going to have left over of my two components? Now, I will emphasize for this, I chose not to include any sort of equilibrium condition, so we're treating it as a tight binding metal. But realistically, that's going to be 
a totally okay assumption when we're talking about something that's a good complexometric reagent. If we're working in such a complicated case that we have to consider that, then we'd probably want to simplify our system more. So if I have no none of my ligand, obviously I'm not going to make any metal ligand complex. I'm only going to have my original concentration. As I start adding in some ligand, it's never in excess. It's always limiting. It's completely used up. We form as much metal ligand as we can, and this is what's remaining of our metal complex. So you can see here, finally, there's a spot where we've used up all of both species. This will be the spot where we are most efficient at completely using up all of our species to form as much of our product as possible. And then as we go down further, we'll be looking at the exact same situation, just with the other reactant being limiting. And so what we've really done is we've kind of bracketed to find the right ratio for our stoichiometry. And notice when it's a 50-50 mix, that's when we have the perfect mix of stoichiometry to convert everything into the metal ligand complex. Now using the molar absorptivity and path length that I had up there, for each of the three species I've calculated an absorbance, and then since absorbances are additive, I've just added all three of these to find our actual absorbance. So what we would have done is we would have never seen all of this stuff originally from our experiment. All we would have seen were the two concentrations that we chose and the absorbance popping out of our spectrometer. But now we can kind of see that, conceptually at least, we should be able to find out information about all of these. And that might seem like a whole lot of steps to have to do, but it turns out it's really not going to be. Because what we can do is we can plot our mole fraction against our total absorbance. And when we do that, we get this sort of a plot, known as a Job's plot. You can see that we have our rising absorbance. We finally hit that maximum, we have that nice 50-50 mix. And so our mole fraction would be a 50-50 mix between the two. So whenever you have that nice sharp peak where the two lines intersect, that's going to be the mole fraction that's going to be the most effective at creating our total concentration. Then it starts dropping back off because I'm no longer in that sweet spot. That seems fairly straightforward for something as easy as 50-50, but let's go ahead and make a more complex stoichiometry. Suppose that we're actually going to have two metals and we're going to have five ligands bridging them. Let's take a look at the Job's plot to see what that would look like. Now what I can say is I can follow this line and I can look for the spot where these two lines will be intersecting. And let's see, so right here we're at 30%. So from that we can say that we're going to have a mole fraction of 30% metal and 70% ligand. And you can see that that's going to be related to what we had here. So I had not quite dead on there, so what I would have actually had to do is draw a best fit line for each of those two segments, and then I'd find the intersection between those two segments for this more complex stoichiometry. And it would also help if I had more points that I was doing in my example test here. But you can see here that, yeah, all right, that seems fairly reasonable. We're going to need two of these for every five of those. So I'm thinking, so what we've got is two-sevenths in this form, and five-sevenths in that form. So our true spot should be 2 divided by 7. So we should be at about 0.285 for the mole fraction, or 0.286. And you can see that we really wouldn't have been able to tell that real easily by eye. But if we had just done a best fit plot here, and a best fit plot here, and found the intersection of these two lines, we would have come up with that value pretty readily. Job's plot is one of the great ways that we can determine stoichiometry of um, any sort of formation uh, reaction where we don't know the stoichiometry in advance.